you've been on the podcast already so and that was a fantastic episode just at the start of the pandemic so go yeah, back yeah, and listen right, to that yeah. if people listening can, can go back to listen to that subscribe to the podcast of course but dan what have you been doing since then because i think we're just going to go with this all right okay well that was well it's about two years ago exactly and it was Actually, yeah exactly two a, years ago yeah it was quite um well, quite a change for everyone. From our point of view, suddenly we realised no one was out coaching anymore. And uh, I don't think anyone has expected that uh, to happen. And so therefore we we had to rethink how we did things. And yes, we we worked around webinars and we worked around providing information that you could do online and not on the pitch. But it really helped us focus ourselves a lot more on exactly what the coach wanted rather than perhaps just working generally about oh this is good stuff to put out there and we we like everybody else had a chance to consider things reflect and it was i mean a terrible time in some ways and a good time in other ways and yeah. i think well, we've we've come out better for it and we're working hard to just keep improving things i think we've we've tried to listen a lot more yeah, I'm all. I'm always wary when people say come out of it, but yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, if we can pick up the lessons, then we'll do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think you're you're completely right. And uh, it's um, probably a bit lazy for me to say to come out of it. I think <laughs> the fact that we're uh, what what I probably mean by that, I'm not trying to dig myself out of it, is that we're actually on the field now, coaching yes. and training, which is which is fantastic. I, I think what I've uh, noticed, I'm not the only person to notice this, but what I've noticed is that younger players are a little bit further behind than they were before, and this is a struggle for them. And I think that. Some players who were probably just hanging on in there have decided to leave the game, and that's caused some teams to really struggle to get the numbers out, which is, which I hope is going to change. I yeah. don't know what you've experienced on that. I, 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 I have definitely seen that. I think, you know, there are, there are lessons to have been learned, and then there are lessons that, as easy as they are to learn, or when you're put into a situation such as the, the pandemic, they're also very easy to unlearn when you go back to what we've been talking about like normal life and they're like i think that you know in terms of like people wanting to play the game or understanding why they play the game is really important and i think that like one of the teams that i coached like that was one of the biggest takeaways that we had was like as soon as they could get as soon as it was the government allowed them to be on a field playing and training they did so and they said, okay, we're going to go through. And even if we haven't got any games for the next six months, we're still going to keep going. And actually what that ended up being was a really bloody long season. And they kind of got mm. burnt out and they overcommitted, you know. And, and the last thing you want, and I think this is why a lot of people might have suddenly sort of dropped out and, and hopefully will be working their way back to the game, is they forgot the, the enjoyment factor that you get from rugby. And I'm hoping oh. that like, this will lead to a lot more people coming back gradually you know and more and more consciously as well i think i like that to that send more consciously because i think the uh, what's happened is that people think that their boredom threshold is very low and they forget that uh, things take effort and you can't be entertained all the time i mean we we talked a little bit about social media and the danger of it mm -hmm. very briefly at the start there and I think just as bad as the next person, I'm sort of, sort of looking at my phone rather than saying, there are times when there's nothing going to be happening mm -hmm. and I cannot do anything about it. I just go sit and think. And there's a couple of occasions uh, recently where I've just been sitting there and I've not had a book or my phone, maybe waiting for something to happen. And I've just said, well, actually, this is quite good for me to be sitting here. It's painful. Mm -hmm. And people aren't necessarily, former players aren't necessarily going back into playing sport because they think that they've got to be doing something else which is unfortunately not rugby related and it'd be great for them to be back in rugby but they they, they they're expecting a lot more from it than there probably was in there in the first place and I think we've just got to be be able to be bored a little bit sometimes not to get 120 percent out of something when in mm -hmm. fact we should be getting say 80 or 70 percent because sometimes you're going to have a bad session. You're going to yeah. come away thinking, thinking, 
uh, that wasn't so good. The coach didn't get it right. I wasn't I wasn't on form. That doesn't mean you leave rugby or you leave the sport. It means that you say that's that's going to happen, and uh, we've got to be maybe a bit more accepting of that. It's a bit like again in social media, and I'm, you're probably good to avoid this. The rugby pundits on television are getting a very hard time of it at the moment. Yeah. And I mean, I'm just as frustrated as the next person when I think a pundit gets it wrong. But really, does it really matter that much if they are making the wrong calls and if they aren't seeing it for what it is? It's just, it's, it's just a game. And we could, we could get it right. We could do it better. We can do everything better. But uh, it, it's entertainment. And sometimes these personalities just say completely the wrong thing. And they don't call it right. Um, maybe we just need to be a little bit more accepting and just get on with things and roll with it yeah maybe i'm getting too grumpy maybe i'm or maybe getting too i'm, I'm too philosophical this. yeah i think in general I, I just think the more this time away i think that's given people both more time to think about what they want to do and and how they want to you know play rugby and enjoy rugby or or, or choose to not do that but it's also given people yeah, with TikTok and all this stuff coming up, like it's given people more things to be distracted by and actually fill up those gaps and, and fill everything up. And, and a lot of, I'm experiencing quite a few people now that are either taking up rugby for the first time or they've not played for six to six plus years, let's say, and they're, and they're, and they're coming back and they want to do it just because they enjoy it. And I think that's really good. And I think that's what the RFU, I, I believe, are trying to get people down to do. But I also think that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of thing. Rugby's changing, and society as society changes as with it as well, or, or society is changing and rugby is changing with it. Mm. And I think that does that mean that like it has to be completely different, and we can't embrace whatever is new? And does it, or does it mean that like who who are we appealing rugby to? or who we try and to get rugby to appeal to is, is something that I concern myself with a bit as well, because I think that it's now becoming a lot more of a spectator first sport, sort of like American football, as opposed to rugby has always been, you know, since I've known it, a sport that just loads of people play. And then, you know, a lot of people will go and enjoy watching rugby as well. But like, you know, it's not uncommon for local small town teams in England to have up to five different teams, even more so in Australia. Like, and that's sort of seeing, I, I keep seeing that dying potentially. Well, I think there's a couple of things tied up in that. I mean, when you come back to rugby, you just start rugby. You've, you've got to actually be fit to play the game. And uh, the difficulty comes uh, when these people rock up and within about five minutes, they are absolutely shattered to start with. But also, there's these players are coming along and they're picking up niggling injuries, which means they come back and then they, they disappear again because they've, they've picked up an injury which they could probably have avoided if they were just a bit fitter. So there's, there's, there's that. So sort of to address the sort of second thing, what, who is rugby for and what is it for? One of the things I've done in the last four or five months is I've just got back into refereeing because there is a shortage of referees where I'm based. I'm based in Bristol and every weekend there's been five to five to ten games which have not taken place or haven't been able to be happen in the right way because there's been no referee. And there's a number of reasons for that, probably the same as the reasons that uh, some of the reasons that players are dropping out. So well, <laughs> there's a lot in that. But the point I was trying to make around that is that I've seen sort of the the grassroots of the grassroots game in action mm -hmm. and i just wonder how why some of these players are playing some of them are playing it for the joy of it and others are just playing it so they can just be nasty with somebody else and i just i just wonder is that is is it's quite hard to referee when somebody is out there yeah, you, you want to make a tackle and you want to physically dominate your player. But actually, they want to harm them in a quite an unfortunate way. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when they do that, like they, they try and uh, smash into someone's head with their shoulder quite deliberately, everybody then becomes very edgy in the game. And it just makes for a bad atmosphere. 
And that's that. It's like watching a bit of these these clips on TikTok of Sunday League football, where someone comes in with two feet, chops a guy, and they fly in the air. What what is possessing that player to come to a game of football or rugby with the intent to harm somebody else? That's not sport. Mm-hmm. I, I think I don't know where that, I don't know where I've taken that from. Where your original? No, question. I know. No, I think there's a. I mean, we we spoke about the the short attention spans and the. The, the social media is looking for the highlight reels and stuff. And I do think that there's something to that as well. Like you'll see it a lot in rugby where, I mean, you even see it at the top level with like Australia or, or I, only, I only say Australia because I saw it come from their account, but England will do the same in any country. They'll lose a game or even they'll get pumped in a game, but they'll still put three or four highlights up of, of, of their team doing well. And I, I get that. Like you want, to appeal and you want to show the highlights, you want to show the things that went well, but that's, it, it kind of goes against what the, the sport is almost. Cause you, you know, if you, if you, if you do take a loss, you take your, you take your licks and you move on. But then also at the same time, like there's nothing wrong with celebrating good moments within a game. So it, it gets difficult, but I think we get a lot of people now potentially that come into rugby just to make that highlight real style, big hit <laughs> or big carry or something and not really care about the actual values of the game and potentially now even going even deeper. Jesus, we're going deep to start this already. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think we did this last time. But potentially I think that like that's why rugby has its traditional values and it leans into those so hard to begin with because it is very tempting to just, in a sport where you can be just a big physical bully, to be a big physical bully and to have values where it's all about camaraderie and having beers after the game and respecting the ref obviously being a huge one. Like I think it needs that in order to survive because if it wasn't, it would be chaos. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I think that there should be always be a bit of edge in the game and the, the, the great thing about rugby is the physicality. 100%. Um, so we can't, uh, we can't go away from that. Um, there is obviously very there's a, there's a lot of concern around head injuries. I think it is more of a concern at the top level because I just feel that sometimes these players seem to come back very quickly and it doesn't seem to make sense. I, I know that they're going through various protocols, but from the outside, it doesn't seem to make sense. But I'm interested to think about rugby values overall. I think it's something which is put out there a lot, but how much do people really follow that through? Yeah. Uh, is there a real culture of following those values as a person, as a player? Because do do people think I'm playing rugby, therefore, yeah, after the game, we'll, we'll shake hands, have a beer and be nice to each other. That's one set of rugby values. But on the pitch, are they looking to cheat their way around the game? Mm-hmm. Are they looking for the uh, to find a way to win the game which doesn't necessarily play within the spirit of the game? And I, I see that more often than I, than it, than it should be happening, and of course the referee is in a in, a, in quite a difficult position because they're not all seeing, mm-hmm. and they're trying to make judgments. Now sometimes there are mistakes which aren't put aren't done to gain advantage. A player goes off their feet, they accidentally come offside because they've been tricked, they knock the ball on because they've they've mistimed something, they mistime a tackle they get themselves into the wrong body position for a tackle, they're not trying to get an edge. But other players, well, they will be niggling. They'll be just pulling a shirt back here. They'll be just putting their hands on the ball for a bit longer. Now, is it up to you and me to go and tell that player to change their values? Is it up to the RFU, the ARU, any of the, the bodies to tell these players? Or is it up to the player to, to do it? I, I read Jurgen Klopp talking the Liverpool manager talking Mm -hmm. about their values at Liverpool. And uh, one of the things is that everybody is responsible for everybody who's on the pitch. And if you're on the pitch, you should respect the fact that somebody has helped you get on there who isn't necessarily Jürgen. It is someone who's laid out the the kit, someone who has cooked the meals, someone who's cleaned the the changing rooms. All these people are all part of it. Mm -hmm. Now, do we tell somebody when they walk in the door, this is who you've got to respect? Or should they come in the, through the door and say, actually, I've got to understand my position here 
and I've got to understand that I need to respect everybody else, whether they are the captain, the manager, or the the bottle washer. Mm-hmm. I think it's there's a communication aspect to all of that as well, right? Because you'll get people that feel so appreciative of everything that they don't say anything and, and try and make it about them and step out of line. You'll see that in rugby. Rugby teams are usually full of people in one or two camps. You'll get those people that just never say anything. They want to be a cog. They don't want to stand out. They'll play sometimes and they'll, they'll by def- default sort of stand out. And then you'll get, and I think this is increasing in teams as, I don't know, just as, maybe it's just me noticing as I get older, but you'll get teams now where there's, too many, I don't know if this is the PC saying anymore, but they'll say too many chiefs and like it, it becomes an issue because, you know, everyone wants their, and I think everyone wants their two cents to be heard. And I think it's also really important to communicate your two cents as a member of any squad, because what you're trying to do as a rugby squad is function as one and win as one. And so if there's, if there's any loose ends that aren't sure of what they're supposed to be doing, they should be telling you what they're seeing. And, and so I find that one of the most challenging and fascinating struggles with rugby is that communication aspect is you've always got to be trying to communicate to the rest of your team what you're seeing and figuring out what they're seeing, whilst also not just adding noise, because it's very easy just to add noise. And I think part of that I've found since doing my work, and I'm obviously going to say this because I work in strength and conditioning, but... I do find that being fitter makes all of that so much easier because you're just, yes. that anxiety is so much lower and all of a sudden everything becomes easier. And it's one of the biggest benefits I've found with the halfbacks I've worked with is that they just always say, oh, I can think so much clearer. And it's like, yeah, because, you know, you, you, your, your heart rate's so much lower, everything becomes slower and easier. Um, I, I think famously, Jamie Roberts, the Welsh centre, yeah. talked about the Welsh fitness regime and how that made such a massive difference to the way that he could operate. Because really, within uh, once you're on the field, within those three or four minutes, if you've made any form of physical contact and run, you're going to feel knackered. Mm-hmm. And obviously, then you recover, but you're in a state of being knackered the whole way, the whole way through. So you've got to be, you've got to be fit. And the challenge, I think, for coaches is that you can't spend your training session making the players fit. You've got to do lots of other things around that. So you have to rely to a certain extent on the players becoming fit. Uh, Mm -hmm. They go off to the gym and, well, who knows what they do in the gym, but some of it isn't very useful, no, it's not. as as you as you well know. This is this is where um, you get the two camps as well. You'll get people if they're if they're people that already love the gym, they're going to carry on doing what they already love, which they don't need any more strength because they're already strong enough. I, I'll always remember when I was so when I work as an actual rugby coach, I stay away from the fitness stuff because you know if you're working if you're coaching two times a week with the game on the weekend. It's just not enough time to do any fitness. So I let them figure out their fitness themselves. Obviously, they can use me for help. But, and so I had a second row who was in late 30s. And he, huge guy, six foot seven, um, built very well. And he was like, you know, I'm, I don't know what sort of strength and condition I need to be doing as I'm getting older. And I'm like, dude, just get on the spin bike. Get, get your zone two work in. Just get aerobically fit. He hated that. I got fined at the end of the season for even making that suggestion to him because he's like, no, I'm a big guy. I'm supposed to be doing big guy stuff. And at the same time, you've got people that go to, they come to rugby because they like the fitness aspect of it. And they, they're not really worried about the weights. They, they, you know, they always stay aerobically fit. So we always stay away from things that we are weaker at and we, we lean into the stuff that we're really stronger at. But the beauty of rugby and the beauty of, this is why I love my job, is that the demands are so... Uh, extreme at all ends of the spectrum they make it a, a challenging problem to solve but then but people only really focus on what they're already good at and i think yeah it's a, it's an yeah, issue but i that think that's, that can be good that'd be good that you can focus when you're good at because Definitely. that gives you confidence yes um uh but, but you can't you, you cannot ignore it rugby still demands a little aspect so yeah i always say that bring up Work on your maximums, absolutely. Yeah. You know, if you're someone who's a, like Johnny May, will still be working on his speed as much as he can because that's what makes him stand out. But he's also worked on everything else just to bring that up to make it good enough so that his speed then stands out. 
Yeah, and I think another thing about fitness so that is very important, and I'm sure you emphasize this, is that you've got to keep stay fit to stay healthy. Because yep. certainly my experience of playing in teams slightly lower down the leagues when we've gone up, well, I think it's the same when you're at the top of the game as well. We've often gone up because our best players have stayed fit throughout the season. Mm-hmm. Now, some of that's luck. You, you never know what sort of knock you're going to take. But it is, m- your muscles are, you, you're not overstraining. You don't pick up re- repetitive, well, I'd, I'm probably using the wrong terms here. But you, let's say you get a bit of a hamstring niggle. Mm-hmm. Now, if you are fit enough, you get yourself back uh, on the field at the right time. If you're not fit enough, you get yourself back too early. And then either you make your hamstring worse or you do something else which is due to the fact is you're sort of hold carrying your hamstrings so th- this this is the difficulty i mean i've i've known players who at the end of the season they're they're half they're half man half tape mm-hmm. because they and you just wonder if it's enjoyable so i mean i've certainly gone onto the pitch very heavily strapped and you, you sort of get to the end of it and you think i've survived it but it's not not necessarily. I mean, no player goes onto yeah. the pitch feeling they are they're they're not carrying something. Hundred percent. But I, I don't know. At the cha- I suppose the challenge from the coach is: Do you when do you tell your players to rest? Because that must be super hard when you are close to the the denouement of the season and you just need to get your best players on the field maximum amount of times. Yeah, that's. There's another bunch of tangents we can go off. We can go off on the fact that, like, go back to the values. I'm not going to choose to go down this rabbit hole, but there's something for another another time, perhaps, about the values of, of rugby and whether rewarding the people that are showing up or, and that are injury-free and having confidence in the whole of your squad, like, what is, the, you know, is that more important than winning your third team Midlands 4 league, whatever, you know? And that's not to say that those leagues don't matter. But, you know, there's not money on those. And, and again, we go back to why you're playing the game in the first place. The other thing I think is this is by far, I believe, the most underappreciated part of strength and conditioning is the ability to... Because there are there are injuries that are inevitable or, or you know, just freak injuries. They happen. But then there are also bunches of injuries that are happen that like could have potentially been prevented you know and, and you're just you're just putting yourself in the position to be have have a much better luck if you're strong and if you're fit and if you're moving well and then there are injuries that are entirely preventable and, and even and especially injuries that happen during training or in the gym like those are really way they're way too common for what i've seen as far as like you're you're playing rugby to play rugby don't like you're going in the gym to help you play rugby then the last thing you should be doing is increasing your injury risk. Like if you've got a bad shoulder and pull-ups exacerbates it, stop doing pull-ups or, and and that's actually just a shout out to someone that recently told me about that. Like, you know, you've got to find ways around it. And and really you're utilizing the gym to stay in the game for longer. And if you can be fit and stay in the game for longer as well, like that's like, you know, I've recently been, the video that's gone out this week on our channel is about staying, you know, playing and enjoying the game as you age funny thing with that is we're all aging like no one's no one's not aging right now so you should all be paying attention to this stuff and if you manage it right like there's mark bright at 43 years of age who i think is the top try scorer in the championship right now there's no you know we we look at age as the numbers that of the years that keep flicking by but age is also the wear and tear and the maintenance that you put your body through and i think if we can manage that during a season, when those seasons add up, you can keep playing on. But also during that season itself, if you can keep more of your players fit, you're right. Everyone always talks about how important it is to have a big squad because injuries are inevitable. But I think you could you could make that number a lot smaller if you just got your, you you know if you just manage that load to help players keep going well i think that you're talking about managing the load and one of the the uh, certainly for young players and i see this uh, i'm working with the the bristol bears under 14s to under 16s and when the player is playing with the under 16s we are constantly seeing that these guys are under a lot of pressure to play for their school their club and for the the academy and 
they are therefore sometimes playing too many times in the week. And of course, they just want to keep playing. They love it. And every time someone asks you to play, you want to play. Now, they are hobbling around. What's going to, what are they going to be like in two, three years' mm-hmm. time? Uh, what, they're going to drop out because they're going to eventually say, actually, it's just great that I've had three or four days off and I actually feel I can move. I mean, this, this is the difficulty, I think, that if you're a good player, you're in demand. Mm-hmm. and you are under pressure to play. And I, I mean, I look back at times in my own rugby career when I probably went back sooner because coaches were keen to say, right, you need to be back in. If you're not playing, then you might, you, you, you're you out of contention. And I, I probably didn't play as well as I should have. And therefore, I either picked up, made my injuries worse. I can remember specifically having a long-term hamstring injury because I came back too early with from a hamstring strain. Mm-hmm. And it's somebody needs to get these players to rest. But also, you, you said about the long pre-season when they were so keen to get back. I think a lot of players came back, trained a lot, and then found themselves, they were, they were shattered, knackered. They were just, they'd lost that buzz for the game. The, I don't know what it was like when you were at school. You were obviously at school a um, much uh, shorter time away than I was. So uh, when I was at school about 30-odd years ago, 35 years ago probably, I think, it's probably it's better to say, I would have a season, of, a season of rugby, a season of another sport, and another season. So I would be doing three months of rugby, three months of, well, it was fives, which is a bit like squash, but with your hands, and then three months of cricket. Mm-hmm. So you'd always be looking forward to playing another sport, and it would keep you, it keep you probably your mind certainly fresh, and if you're not your body. But these some of these players are playing probably twelve months a year of rugby, and perhaps that's too much. Definitely, I distinctly remember you, you said about players when they're young, always wanting to play, and they'll still keep playing. That is true until it's not. I remember when I was seventeen. And I was playing uh, senior club rugby, which was, I think it was level seven at the time, just for my local club. On the odd occasion, I'd play, I'd play Colts the day after. Mm. I'd play school rugby on a Monday or a when no, I'd play school rugby on a Wednesday. And then I'd have county training on Monday and I think Friday. And it was just, you know, and then I'd have, I don't know, I had county games on Wednesday. It was just, and it just, this was like, and all of that came together maybe like October, November of, of that year. And I remember getting into December. And luckily, my first team coach at the time was Peter Engeldau, who's uh, he coaches in South Africa now. He coached the Grickers, very good coach. And he was my mentor at the time as well. And I told him about this. And I was like, look, I can't, I can't keep doing rugby. Like, this is too much. And he told me, he was like, okay, no problem. Like, take, take a few weeks off. Like, we're heading into Christmas. Just take all of December off. And I remember that I wasn't in the pool when they did the selections and whatever. And then the, set, the captain of the second team came up to me and he's like, "Are you get, so how come you're not available this Saturday? I just said, I, I can't play. Like I've had too much. And he says, oh, so you can play. So you're here. So you can play for us. And he was really trying to push me to still keep playing for the seconds. Because he's like, you're young. Like, what are you, like, how, how is that possible? But I think mental burnout is a thing. And then I also think that when you're young and you only know rugby as pursuit of, essentially like excellence you forget about and and the competitive nature of it you forget about how just enjoyable it is and how good it is to keep going back with your mates and I think it's still possible to go back to that because you look at Mike Tyndall who's still still playing club rugby Mm -hmm. that must be is that does he live near you down that way yeah I think he lives in Gloucestershire doesn't he so uh, he's uh, yeah he's certainly uh, playing for and that's that's brilliant to see yeah fantastic Uh, because he just loves 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 the game and I can remember playing um, high level on a on a Saturday, and then on the Sunday going playing for my old university team in a Saturday friend and a Sunday friendly. Mm-hmm. And someone said to me, "But why?" And I said, "Just because I enjoy playing. Yeah. It's just playing with your mates, and there is a different sort of is a different sort of pressure. You, it's great to play the pressure games. I certainly remember when I played sort of trying trying to break into." the Bath first team. So I played a lot of second team games and, but they weren't league games. So I missed league 
the, mm -hmm. the, the, the excitement of playing a game where there was something on the game. And so you, you need to have those ex different experiences. I mean, that, I mean, that's, that's a personal point of view, of course. And I, I look at some players now, I look at my own son and he says, I can only really play one or two games of rugby a week. And I, I think, well, God, when I was your age, I was probably playing three games of rugby a week and playing five side football and playing squash and trying to play as many sports as I possibly can mm -hmm. and playing some football as well. So was I actually not as fit as I should have been? Was I a complete idiot? Is he, is he being, is he not being as fit as he could be? Is, is it, how different is it now? I mean, w why was I able to do that then? And I'm not a particular, I wasn't particularly, I was athletic, but I wasn't like the super fittest person there. Is, is it, is it kids now saying, I don't have the energy? What's changed? I'm going to ask you that. The game, <laughs> I mean, as a, as a coach, like you've seen, you know, and running better rugby coaching for as long as you have, you, you, you've seen the game or Rugby Coach Weekly, should I say? Is it is it now Rugby Coach Weekly? Yeah, Rugby Coach. We used to used to be. We used to send out um, a thing called Better Rugby Coaching, which was an email, but we now call it Rugby yeah, Coach Weekly. Rugby. So we've just was it. Yeah. So you're right to say that, but I, it's uh, I can't remember when we changed that. But anyway, yes, go on. So you've done that for years now. You must yeah. have seen the game. Yeah, you, you you would have done it when I first got into coaching 10, 15 years ago. So the game has massively changed in that time. Well, people are, te are telling us that the game has changed. Ha Number one, what do you think some of those changes are? And can you m maybe reflect on what those look like with the Six Nations? But also, is is that change at that level a reflection of changes that we're seeing at the lower levels as well? Because I think it's very easy, and I think this is one of the things that I've seen with, with rugby, is that they keep changing the laws to to manipulate what they're seeing at the in the professional and the international game and the elite game whether those laws are even necessary or yeah or even necessary or, or or improving the game at an amateur level is something that i'm not sure is even really considered so i'd like your opinion on that but yeah what what, what changes do you think there have been within the game well, I think the shape of the game has changed. Some things have made the game change, just like things like uh, the fact that the ball is uh, tends to be a bit stickier than it was because the ball manufacturers are better. And if anyone goes to a, a training session and the ball is slippery, they know that the, the whole shape of the game changes. You just can't be uh, that sort of fragile. Well, they'll, just, they'll, they'll just drop it. They'll just drop it and they'll, they'll switch it out for yeah. the grippier ball. They're like, oh, what's this? If it's not perfectly yeah. pumped up as well. No, we're not going to use yeah. that one. <laughs> So I think that's changed. I think the expectations of what you can get at training sessions has changed. I think uh, overall the general level of coaching has improved and that's because there are more coaches who are more invested in coaching properly. Yeah, and there's a lot more access to information. Players going to training sessions are expecting a little bit more from the training sessions. The shape of the game, I don't changed enormously up to a certain level because the time you have to coach and train is not you still at a grassroots level if you can get two training sessions in a week and a game then you've done well at the pro game i think in the last four or five years it's probably not changed that much either because there's only so much time that is available to players and coaches yes their, their analysis is probably improved i think that the, the types of play that are available might have changed a bit, but I don't think it's changed enormously in the last four or five years. You're right that the, the laws have changed a few things around the edges of the game. I think one of the mm -hmm. most important thing is that there's a lot more emphasis on tackling lower. The game hasn't gone soft when players, if a player gets a shot to the head, then there, is, there needs to be a very serious look at why that happened. And if, if the players can tackle lower a lot more then that's good and you, we certainly saw some games in the six nations where there was no even thought to challenge whether it was a high tackle because there were no mm -hmm. high tackles yet obviously the the big the big story was the red card and start of the england versus ireland game and i don't think there's any doubt it was a red card oh Did yeah i don't even think that is, that is a story right i think that's yeah i think that shows what's what's happening i mean it's i think that's normal and i think it's what we said about injuries as well, like those when you're tackling that high, 
I think that is entirely preventable. You know, you you have incidents where someone's falling and they hit their head, or you know, a nasty Ooh. nasty collision with two potentially two teammates when they come together and they make a tackle at the same time. You'll Ooh. see that. But if you're just generally going in and tackling that high, yeah, that's that's technique. Yeah, I I, I agree, and I think the 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 question came: Did it spoil the game? And in a sense, it did, because you want to see 15 versus 15 right from the start. And obviously, Ireland and England came there to win. There was a lot on the game. And as soon as it's 14 versus 15, then no, it wasn't necessarily a foregone conclusion. But at that level, it's probably going to be that way. So as a spectacle... In one sense, it did spoil it. As in another way, it was a great game because England had to make some changes. They they made those changes, and they were it, that was fascinating for that. But Ireland, in the end, had to adjust, and that was interesting. Mm-hmm. But I don't think I think a lot of people got very fussed about it, and it it was fourteen versus fifteen. That was what it was, and we just needed to accept that and. The thing is, of course, if someone is paying £100 plus for a ticket and the game immediately changes shape right from the start, it's like the Italy game, I can't remember the week before, when they were down to 13 because of the the vagaries of the front row rules and that sort of thing. It's very tough. The thing is, of course, if that happens in a pickup game on a Saturday when Ding's thirds play old, old St. Bernadette's mm-hmm. seconds, then it then it's different because the game won't be shaped so much by one player going off right at the top level. It there's so there's it's all on the margin, and eventually those players are going to run out of steam. So I think at the top level, it's interesting you say they're looking to gain entertainment. Our judgment of entertainment is very different. Some people think an entertaining game is when it is extremely physical. Other people think it when uh, they pass the ball around a lot. Others, when they think they sidestep, some say when the players are physically dominating another player. It's. I think the game has got... You've got to approach each game and look for the things that you're going to enjoy. The difficulty is, of course, that the head coaches are all there to win games. And mm-hmm. three head coaches came away from the Six Nations thinking they'd had a bad Six Nations. One was delighted they won a game. That's the Italian coach. Yeah. And then the French and the Irish were probably quite pleased. So, yeah, it's always the case. The knives are out for the ones who don't finish in the top two. Yeah. And it can be down, for instance, in, in England's case, a few small margins and it could have gone the other way. But that's equally the case for Wales and equally the case probably for for Ireland. France could have quite easily lost against Wales. England could have quite easily lost against Wales and then the knives would be even out. But it's, it's just... The, I think someone said it, one of the commentators said it, they would, they would love to be able to go out next week and replay the game. The great yeah. thing with grassroots rugby is you can often... There's only a week until your next game. The Six Nations happens February, March and then you've got all that time until another one. Ah. Uh, <laughs> very frustrating for an international coach yeah. especially when you were so close and yet so far definitely I think we put it on a a bit too sometimes well, I mean it's rightly on a pedestal the Six Nations because it's it is once once a year you get one chance at each team and then it's gone and then that's it and because it's only you know five games I mean for the last few years you could even rule out the Italy game each, each the, the consequences of every single game and therefore every single you know action of every game means that it's that you know that it's so it seems so important but then again and this is something that I've thought about you know as a coach as far as like Eddie Jones's job people will say you know they'll England will gladly take that if this means you know they'll take a couple even coming fourth fourth or fifth in a few for a few six nations if it means they're going to win the world cup but that world cup is even less of a snapshot like it's such a small like you would have thought England did everything right in 2019 and they still, you know, they'll reflect on that World Cup not as as, as a negative because they didn't beat what was a, a one performance by South Africa that was just phenomenal. And potentially 
still not as good as the England performance that they put in against the All Blacks the week before. And every South African watching this is probably going to uh, crucify me in the comments just for suggesting that. But I think it's true. Like, like Ireland have never got past the quarterfinal for so long. And I don't think there's any voodoo or anything crazy. It's just, it is really hard. And there's only one team in the world every four years that can win the World Cup. And, you know, for every one team that is a winner, there are, what, 19 losers? And so... Well, I think that I quite like the golf... Is strange uh, with that. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I quite like the golf idea that uh, the best way to enter a golf tournament is to say that it's the field of 80, let us say, one person's going to win. So if I judge myself on whether I win or not, then I, I'm always... I'm generally going to be unhappy. And... The Six Nations just should be saying, right, it's a fantastic chance to test yourself. And mm-hmm. maybe we should get rid of the bonus points in the table and just take take away some of the, the edge in winning it is because it, it, it lessens, I think, the, the spectacle. I think, I mean, like the Lions, the Lions, the previous Lions tour was ridiculous. It became, yeah. it, it's just, I don't it think they'll off. ever I, I thought, I thought it, that, that, that might be the death of the Lions, that, that tour. I well, I, I, think, I think it, I personally, I think it died in after 1997. I expect I'll be hammered. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, <laughs> was it 1997? The fantastic yep. tour. Obviously a great spirit, some great videos. And from then on, it's just become more and more commercial. And the commentators become part of that because they say, you know, his first Lions thing, da 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 of course, it'd be amazing to put on the Lions shirt, but it becomes it becomes a much bigger thing than it should be. It is it is an honour, but it should be more about the sport and the joy of the sport and the joy of movement than all in. I've got to we've got to win this, mm-hmm. and I mean Warren Gatland Gatland was just wanted to win. He produced teams that were successful. I didn't enjoy the way that the Lions played generally. Obviously, I was pleased when they they did they did win games, but it wasn't played. They didn't play in a particularly inspiring, uh, yeah, inspiring way. And they, uh, I mean, when they won in Australia, they won it by winning scrum penalties overall. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, uh, the Australians were punch drunk, and then they they started to play well. I would quite like put together a side just to go out and play, play some rugby, try some things, do not necessarily play like the Barbarians. And I think the Barbarians has become like that way. It's uh, They've got to play in a certain way. They've got to do, they've got to almost be silly and that, that sort of thing. And I, I just, I just think it's just, we, we, we put too much emphasis on a perceived value and just don't just go and play the game for the sake of playing the game. And when, when when you turn out and you run onto the pitch, as I said, after about three or four minutes, your lungs are burning. You don't think you're going to last another 80 minutes. You do. There's something inside you which does that. And that's the joy of it. And I think you said very early on when we're talking, are we trying to make this thing a spectacle? And let's forget making it a spectacle. Let's just enjoy it because... Players are trying their hardest. They're enjoying what they're doing. To a certain extent, they're enjoying what they're doing. They're trying to impose their own skill on the game. And the coach is helping support that. Let's enjoy it for that, as opposed to we want them to see them do this number of this type of pass or do this sort of spectacular stuff. Some, sometimes yeah. games with no tries can be absolutely thrilling. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's great attack is then thwarted at the last moment by great defense. So why not? And also sometimes games in the rain. Uh, I mean, uh, a Six Nations game can just change on change on the weather. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not quite sure where I was going quite going anyway. with that last point. <laughs> yeah, but I just think overall, we've got to avoid creating, well, it's creating a monster, really, and recognizing what the game should be. It's like, uh, should we have an all singing and all dancing spectacle when you go to a match or should you go for just a match? And I think the answer is actually, it's a match day experience. And the match day experience, so this is another rabbit hole, I think is spoiled by the fact that some people 
do not sit and watch the game for 80 minutes. They were mm-hmm. up and down the whole time. And that, I mean, I haven't been to an international since 2012. New Zealand versus, well, England versus New Zealand, I don't think I could ever top that as an experience because I just knew that I'm just going to be frustrated by people getting up and down the whole time to go and get another beer. And mm-hmm. uh, maybe the day when you can have a seat and the beer pops up in front of you, that would be... Uh, that would, would solve be, everything. Be that'd, that'd be perfect. Because then, yeah, you're, you're right. Because it is part of that match day experience is, I mean, it's the match, it's watching the game, but then it is, there is a good social aspect to it as well. I, I, you know, I can imagine. I think, I think what we've got to understand is, particularly as, as, as players, is how people want to appreciate the game. You touch on it a little bit as far as, you know, if, if every player just accepts their role and sort of does what, you know, just tries their best to get the enjoyment out of it. I think sometimes rugby, you know, especially in England, is it's quite a long season. But in general, if you're if you're in the midst of a rugby season or even just starting out a pre-season, it seems quite daunting. It can be seen as a bit of a grind. But I think if you can flip that on its head and you take enjoyment from the fact that you know you're 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 being able to participate in this amazing sport that you can solve in so many different ways, it can help. I'd like to ask you because you mostly work with coaches when you do coach with players like what do you think players can do as they approach individual training sessions and we, we see it a bit more of, as to how professionals approach it but amateurs can take some of that away as well like you know even if they're just training the twice a week or whatever there's a lot of things that they i think they can take away and, and how they in how that they can approach a rugby training session in order to, not just to you know improve but like get the most enjoyment and, and why those two things probably aren't even very mutually exclusive at all. Yeah. I, I mean, I know you sent the question to me bef- before we came online. And uh, so it was a quite interesting one to reflect on. I think the first thing is that uh, players have got to recognize that they've got to put themselves forward. They've got to create the energy themselves just as much as they expect the coach to create the energy. They can't just go there and expect to be entertained and automatically motivated. I'm going there to make the most out of the session. So if an exercise is being run, I want to put myself at the front as much as I can. I don't want to sit and wait for things to happen to me. I think the other thing is to just to know that you've got to go through some sort of pain it's going to be hard and one of the things i'm quite interested in at the moment is is the pain of reading and writing i just came across it in a book the other day but i've also been thinking about it in trying to help my players think more deeply about what they're doing if you have to sit down and read a book that is not a straightforward thing it doesn't come easy. we're much happy to sit and listen or watch some television or something like that so you read a book and you get a lot more out of reading a book when you take the time, sit down and maybe make some notes, write about it. Um, and if someone says to you, can you explain what's going on? Sit down and try and write it. Now, not everyone is going to be Shakespeare or uh, J.K. Rowling and be able to just write naturally. But that is effort. And if you want to really get something out of a training session, be prepared to go and sweat. Be prepared to also ache and be prepared to have to think deeply about what you're doing because then you're going to get a lot more out of it. Mm. If you, yeah, you naturally, there'll be laughs. You can't get a bunch of rugby players in one place and there not to be some laughs. It's almost impossible. I can't think of an occasion where I haven't been in a training session and there's been no laughs. Yeah. And that, if you're in that team, laughs. leave. That's never going to, like, that's, yeah, yeah, I can't think of that would happen. Like, everyone, and that's why everyone thinks that their team's like the best team. Like, it's, it's a good, it's a yeah. good thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But I think the other thing that you have to understand is that you're not going to agree with everyone. Mm-hmm. There are going to be people in that team who are not your type of person. Now, you've got to be prepared to accept their point of view. You don't have to believe in it. And you will. And sometimes the coach is going to say stuff that's not going to be what you like. And sometimes the coach is going to drop you. And Mm -hmm. you cannot, and you have to be resilient about it. If they're bullying you, that's different. But 
you've got to be able to say, sometimes someone's going to say you're wrong. You haven't made enough effort. That You're not getting that right. And if you are good enough, strong enough, you will be able to bounce back and get on. And that is, that's one of the reasons why you should play sport because it allows you to be in a place where if you make a mistake, it doesn't matter as much as uh, making a mistake in maybe other walks of life because there's always next week. That is And huge. if the worst, the worst comes, yeah. You're like, oh, sorry, I have, to, I have to cut in there because that is... Like the biggest thing I always try and say now with people at training is I reflect on my years, especially like early 20s, late teens. And I was, you know, trying to really try eventually make rugby my career and do all of that stuff. And I remember I was a back row. So that's always in any club you go to ever, back row is always the most competitive position. Mm. And so I was essentially probably on reflection, like petrified of making mistakes because I knew if I made a few mistakes... I wouldn't start the, the following weekend or even worse, I'd be dropped to the, to the 18. Like, and that, like, like that, my ego hated that idea. So therefore I would just do everything I could that I knew I was already good at mostly, you know, I wouldn't put myself out there. I wouldn't try and take on new roles. I wouldn't even involve my game. And when I reflect on that, like what's the purpose of training? It's training. It's practice. You're like, that's, if you're going to make mistakes, like make them there because that's the only way, you, like you're never going to just go, okay, now I'm going to try and develop a 30, 30 meter left-handed spin pass. And you're never going to do it the first time. You're not even going to do it the first like, hundred times. You've got to get those reps in and you're going to fail with those reps. And you said you've got the skill acquisition science guys talking about it. And I, I know that there's some people that have the thought of, it doesn't even matter how many of those reps are failure. As long as you just keep getting repetition in with the idea of whatever it is you're trying to achieve. So we say this 30 meter spin pass. It doesn't actually, the result of what your, your each repetition isn't important. The app, it's just the intention. As long as you keep doing it, you're going to build up that volume to get better. And I think so many, so many players and, and athletes like they're, they're sort of don't want to do that. They want to, train as if it's a match or train as if and even in the gym as well like they're afraid to lift slightly lighter weights than they did before because what like, there's no reason like it, you're not going to get weaker because you're lifting lighter weights you, you might actually get stronger because you've, you, you've adjusted your your technique and you're lifting better it's it's funny that we don't we're so afraid to to make mistakes and, and take back steps but it's also completely understandable but i think the more we can bring awareness to that like the the better people's training experience and the results of those training experiences can be and also to add add to that is that uh, training is not just about the game training is about lots of other things that if you if you play rugby just to play the game then you're probably joining for the wrong reasons and yeah it is about meeting people, enjoying mm. other people's company, but also there are, there's plenty of life lessons in there. I mean, I'm not going to go into the, you don't do, you don't play rugby for life lessons, but there are life lessons in there. So I would say that, yeah, from a, from a, from a player's point of view, you've got to bring some energy. You've got to be prepared to make some mistakes and you've also got to be prepared to go through a bit of pain. And if that's a physical and mental pain, that's fine. I mean, pain in a positive way, of course, not in a, in a negative way. And yeah, it's what's changed perhaps in the last five, 10 years is that we are very easily distracted or there are more distractions. Mm -hmm. If you had a break in training and you allowed the players to have their phones out on the pitch, you know that most of them will go and check their phones. Yeah. And what's going to have changed in the last half an hour is probably very, very little. Absolutely nothing. Uh, nothing important. No. There is going to be the you're on a training pitch and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, the only, just before Christmas, I refereed a game and the hooker, his partner was expecting a baby. So every 10 minutes he checked on the sideline whether he was he was needed and that's a yeah, that's the benefit sorry. of having phones available because otherwise he wouldn't have even exactly. been able to go to the game to do that so well yeah, exactly awesome. so that that was that's excusable but i mean i'm just as bad as the next person 
I've got, I'm speaking to you here, I've got my WhatsApp switched off. My phone is under my papers here, and it's just nice. I have looked at my phone, but I only looked at it to see where it was. I probably didn't check my social media. And that's, and it's refreshing. And so maybe one of the great things about Ruby training is you just spend an hour and a half away from your phone, which must be a, which yeah. must be a good thing. And to go back to your, your, when you were talking about thinking all the time and, and being distracted, like there's not like, that's one of the best things. I still go and play touch rugby wherever I am. If there's touch rugby local to me, I'll, I'll go and do it because I can't, I can't play rugby anymore because of my concussions. I do jujitsu and I do touch rugby. And those two things and coaching as well when i'm when i'm coaching like those three environments when i'm in them i'm not thinking about the rest of the world or any any of those problems i'm i'm completely in that moment which is just bloody fantastic and i think as as far as talking about the role of fitness the 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 fitter you are the easier those moments but i do find that 100 percent the easier it is to be in those moments and those moments be like clearer. Maybe you're still in the moment when you're, when you're, when you are really knackered, but that moment is just loud noise of how exhausted you are. Whereas when you're calmer, like you can, it's allowed me to progress my jujitsu. It's allowed me just to enjoy the touch rugby and even playing with, you know, old blokes and there's old women there as well. And, you know, we're all just having a laugh very different from my my proper playing days but it's just as enjoyable because you, you're you're in that moment i'm not comparing that moment to going ah oh, this isn't the same as when i had you know a crowd of 5000 people watching me play and for for poland or whatever you know it's it's none of that it's just this is this moment right now and what's my next what's my next job or my next challenge in this moment and then occasional reflections of oh this is pretty cool yeah I'm mean, always fascinated by pro golfers who go out and play a round of golf with their friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, uh, and you think, well, they must they must just enjoy enjoy the game. And I mean, I I play golf, and that's a great is that's a great way of escaping and not looking at phone. But there are people I play with who will be who will be checking their phone as we're going around. And I think that that is I. Well, I think it's bad. It's bad manners, personally, to check mm -hmm. your phone during a round of golf, unless there is something important. I mean, my son, uh, a couple of weeks ago, was checking his phone, but he'd just been to a job interview and was hoping for the call back. So that was, I'll, I'll allow that, like the, the guy waiting to hear whether his wife was going into labor or not. Mm -hmm. I think I probably would say that going to play a game of golf if your wife was just about to go to labor is probably pushing it <laughs> yeah. because the game of rugby where you are the hooker is might, might be different, but that could be for another, another discussion. Definitely. I think there is just to finish off, like I do think like there's a huge movement at the minute and I somehow in my life I've always, and I felt like I've always ended up just like a, a couple years ahead of the curve and that's probably just because that's my field of awareness. Like I'm not aware of this thing until I'm in it. And then I see it grow and grow mm -hmm. once I'm in it. But meditation is is getting up there. Ironically, there's like hundreds, if not thousands of apps on your phone that you can use to meditate. But that's actually something that I've been started to use with the athletes that I coach and the players that I coach. Because I think especially because sometimes rugby can, if you let it, add to the stresses that you've got to do. Yes, there's the moments in the games that you, like are, you cannot replicate in terms of like life enjoyment, but then there's also, there is just another, you know, four hours plus on your weekly schedule, plus being able to stay fit, plus the injuries that potentially come as part of it. You know, it, it can be seen as somewhat of a selfish endeavor, but it's not, it can't be the only source of your stress management and stress management Again, as we, we've spoken about earlier, uh, factors that can help you keep playing as you age and uh, keep enjoyment from the rugby is like lowering that amount of stress. And just as tough as it is to sit down and just read a book, it's also just tough to sit down and do nothing for, you know, yeah. and they start people at 10 minutes because they think, because people, no one has, no one doesn't have 10 minutes, you know, I actually try to recommend at least 20 to 30 minutes because Again, you will have that time, 
but that's when that time actually then makes you more productive. It, you're, you're then in control of your brain almost so that you, so that those extra 23 hours or whatever, or, you know, minus the eight hours of sleep actually then are way more in control than they would be had you be underslept, overstressed and your mind racing. Like that's no way to live. And at the end of the day, like we spoke about the reasons for playing rugby and it is just another way that we try and get through life and enjoy it as best we can. Definitely. Definitely. I, I mean, I think this is something becoming clearer and clearer to me and I need to look into is how to calm your mind however however you do it because I think that would be... Well, certainly speaking completely selfish would be really good for me. <laughs> let, yeah. alone for, let alone for but, anyone else. But if, 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 you're, if it's helping you out, then you know, they say put your life vest on before assisting others. It's the same thing, right? Yeah. So if, you, if you're able to help people better... And speaking of which, you are you said you're working with the the Bristol Academy. Where else are you working at at the minute? And how else can people get more insights into the coaching and, and the rugby that you do? Well, I'm lucky. I'm very busy with uh, rugby out uh, every night of the week. So I'm with the Bristol Bears under 16s, under 40s, or under 16s program. Working really enjoying myself at a local club in Bristol called Broad Plain. Been helping out there with their a little bit with their first team and one of the girls' teams and the under-18s. and But I suppose the, the most rugby I do during the week is I'm working with the University of Bristol women's team, which is is great, a completely different challenge. I really enjoy, enjoy that. So that's my coaching at the moment. Uh, rugby Coach Weekly, obviously, is my day job, so I'm editor of that. And we are always looking to listen, find out more, you know, what is going on, what's different, what can we do differently? So that's always interesting. Talking and rattling on as I had to today has made me think about a few things as well. And yeah, that's uh, my main, that's what tends to fill up I'll my put, days. I'll and put the link meditation. to, <laughs> I'll put a link to Rugby Coach Weekly in the links below this video right, and this podcast. I, I'm a member. I'd highly, I'd highly recommend it, Eat for, especially for players. I think, as we said, like, you know, as players, how you can sort of help shape and help improve your, your rugby training experience. It's not, you know, you don't have to, I mean, that's actually a very good idea. I, I, I think I would welcome as a coach, someone saying, Hey, we want to work on this. What do you think of this drill? And you, you know, send, send a cut or a game, you know, send those ideas. But there's also just a lot of thoughts on the managing the game of rugby and how to play it. And I think rugby is as, you know, it's getting more and more physical, but it's also, yeah, there's deeper and deeper tactical levels that we can play the game. So the more thinking that you do, better that can be. And I think that you know, if you're if you're considering it and if you want to improve your your knowledge as a rugby player, Rugby Coach Weekly is a is a fantastic resource. Oh well, thank you for saying that. We're always uh, interested to hear from people on what they're doing, how they're doing it. We don't have don't have all the answers uh, and we want to find out more so we just we just love listening to what people have got to say so yeah thanks very much for saying that no no problem and i want to thank you for your quote that you told me two years ago i still right. repeat on a couple on a, on a on a regular basis at least at least one or two times a month is when you said about how there are a lot of coaches who have ten years of ex of ten years of coaching, but they actually have one year of experience that they've just repeated ten times. Uh, versus... It's not. It's not my. It's not my quote, by the way. It's someone <laughs> else. I can't remember. Yeah. Well, if you can't yeah, remember whose it was, <laughs> I just, I, I'm, I'm then it's yours. Apologies for the person. Yeah, I mean, I, it's often repeated, and I think it's a yeah. good. Thing. You're always changing. I've just uh, published an article by. Dave Allred, who was Johnny Wilkinson's kicking coach, and he says he is always refining and changing. So I think that the best coaches are, and yeah, if if you're not different, certainly in five years' time to what you were, then you know perhaps you need to think again about why you're in it. Yeah, like you kind of have no choice. Not even as a like, especially as a coach, because you're imparting your experience onto everyone else, but as a as a human right you, you you are as we said as i said earlier like everyone is aging so use your experience and 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 use it for the benefit as opposed to just the declining of of 
whatever the biological systems are going at, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, that's great. I'm glad. I mean, I've just really, I, I, well, first of all, it's just great to chat about rugby and you asked some great questions, which I have rambled on. have made me think a lot actually about coaching and players and that sort of thing. So yeah, I think I've, there's a few articles to come out of what you've made me awesome. think about. So link me to them that's, and that's uh, I'll, I'll share yeah. them out and we'll get you back on Dan. This has been great. Once again, thank you so much for giving up your time to, to come on. Thank you. Thank you.